right. Um, you're very welcome to the uh, Engineers Ireland Women in Engineering Group official launch for International Women's Day. Um, we are delighted to be hosting this event on International Women's Day. My name is Georgina Malloy. I'm the chair of the Women in Engineering Group. I'm a chartered engineer, uh, a chartered civil structural engineer with 20 years experience. Um, in consulting engineering. Um, for the last 12 years, I've worked in scaffold design consulting um, within a contracting firm. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, we had our first um, Women in Engineering Group meeting, and it was an open call just for everyone to come and join a meeting to elect a committee. And that was at the start of January, and we had over 30 people at the meeting, which was brilliant for the first week in January in lockdown. Um, so we had 30 people at the meeting, and absolutely everyone at the meeting volunteered to be on the committee or help host an event or get involved in some way. So we were delighted. Um, we elected a committee of 12 people, and I, in, I'll introduce the committee to you in a few minutes. Um, so the goal of the group really is to network share, to um, share knowledge and experience, and hope, hopefully see what we can do to address um, the gender balance in engineering and diversity in general. Um, we would, uh, there's a question and answer box are, uh, at the bottom of your screen. So feel, please feel free to put any questions or comments that you have into the box. And uh, Maurice Buck Buckley, the president of Engineers Ireland will um, officially launch the group and speak to us followed by Caroline Spillan, the director general of Engineers Ireland. Then we'll have a panel discussion and I'll introduce the panel to you just before they speak. Um, They'll talk, uh, discuss various topics for about 40 minutes. And then we'll have about 20, 25 minutes for um, participant questions and answers and comments, um, where you can put your questions into the question and answer box and have some discussion with the panel. So please, from now on, put in, in any questions and answers that um, come to you during the discussion. And I'll read out as many as I can to the panel um, at about half one. We might, depending on time, we might not get to all the questions and answers, but please keep putting them in because we will be able to read them later and they could well inform events that we have in the future or things that we decide to do going forward. Um, so I'll introduce the committee to you. Uh, lovely. So Bridget Milan is the group secretary. She's a chartered engineer specializing in bridges and civil structures, and she's the director of Hewson Consulting Engineers Ireland. Susan McGarry is the group's liaison um, to industry. She's a chartered civil engineer. She's the managing director of Ecosem Ireland, and she's Engineers Ireland representative on the Modern Methods of Construction Working Group. Sarah Bonsgill is the group's public uh, relations officer. She's a senior engineer with Byrne O'Cleary Consulting and a former member of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at SEAI. Uh, Dr. Rena Cole is the group's liaison with third level institutions. She's a chartered engineer. She's the Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs at the Faculty of Science and Engineering in UL. She lectures in mechanical engineering and she's the Athena Swan Champion in the School of Engineering. She's trying to increase the amount of women studying engineering, and she says that we can all be role models in this. If she can be, if she can see it, she can be it. Sarah Flanagan is a chartered civil engineer. She has 12 years experience in engineering consultancy, um, working as resident engineer and project manager. Jan C. George is a civil engineer with 15 years experience in the Irish public sector. She has experience in engineering design on light rail projects, and she's working in the management and delivery of national roads projects. Jill O'Donnell is a chartered electrical engineer. She joined ESB as a graduate in 2007, and she's currently a telecoms senior professional with ESB. Enya McHale is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University. She has a degree in energy engineering, and she's a graduate business risk analyst with Grant Thornton Ireland. Um, 
Emer Pepper is a chartered mechanical and manufacturing engineer. She has an MBA. She's the vice president in the technical asset management team at SMBC Aviation Capital, a leading global, global aircraft leasing company. Colette O'Shea is the vice chair of the group. She's a chartered civil engineer and a fellow of Engineers Ireland. She's 18 years experience in the delivery of infrastructure projects. She's a senior project manager with the National Development Funding Authority delivering PPP projects for higher education. Orla Costello is a mechanical engineer. She has 20 years experience in maintenance environments. She is the engineering manager with Perry Foods on the Charleville site where the tea strings are made, she tells us. Um, she also sits on the IFAC Inclusion and Diversity Committee and is a member of the Insight Cooley Research Lab based at WIT. Um, so that's the committee. Um, I will hand you over now to Morris and Caroline, and I will ask um, the team, actually I should have told you, the theme of our event today is in line with International Women's Day. It is choose to challenge breaking down barriers. And I'm going to ask everyone to think about what they choose to challenge. And I'm going to invite Morris and Caroline to tell us what they choose to challenge. Thanks, Morris. Thanks, Georgina. Um, you can hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Great. OK, uh, a challenge to start off with. Um, I'm delighted, first of all, to welcome everybody here today to the launch of the Women in Engineering Group. Back in um, 2018, Engineers Ireland set about establishing a diversity group, which commenced work in 2019. And it was as a result of that work that the Women in Engineering Group was formed. And as Georgina has already uh, said there, the aim of the group is to support women pre and post graduation, including those returning from a career break who have chosen to pursue a career in engineering. So as to develop their skills and competencies and really to fully realize the potential in and out of the workplace. We're delighted in Engineers Ireland that this group has been established uh, and just coming out of Engineers Week last week. I think it's really important, and we're doing that, that we're trying very hard to encourage young women to pursue a career in engineering, uh, that they see the contribution that engineers make to society, and that they too can be a part of this. For example, um, Engineers Ireland declared a climate and biodiversity emergency around this time last year. And sometimes I just wonder, if we might have done this a few years sooner, if we had a higher female representation in the organizations, many other benefits as well, if we can achieve greater uh, gender balance and diversity inclusion. So we here in Engineers Ireland have been fortunate uh, to have many great role models for women in engineering through past presidents, such as Jane Grimson, who was the first female president of the institution back in 1999, followed five years later, 2005, by Anne Butler, and then 2014 uh, with Regina Moran, and also 2019, last year, with my predecessor, Marguerite Sayers, and next year, we will welcome Professor Orla Feely as president. So it's a very minor milestone for humankind, but. I am the first president of Engineers Ireland who will be both preceded by and followed by a female president. At the moment, 32% uh, of the members of the Engineers Ireland Council are female, and that's probably as high as we've had it, and it's excellent. It's well in excess of the representation within our membership and in college courses at the moment. As the economy recovers now post-COVID, Critical skills shortages will certainly re-emerge in engineering and technology sectors. And we really must redouble our efforts to address the underrepresentation of women within the engineering profession. There's a need for a much larger and more diverse workforce. And it's never been more important to inspire and encourage more people, especially young women, to study engineering at third level and to choose a career in engineering. I was by several of the talks last week during Engineers Week, including, for example, an interview by Steps Ambassador and Data Knot, Vanula O'Reilly in Silicon Republic, 
where she was talking about the metaphor, you'll all have heard it, of the leaky pipeline when discussing gender balance in, in, in this profession. The numbers of girls studying STEM subjects at junior cert and at leaving cert is actually, is actually quite good now. It's reasonably balanced. And the number taking honors maths has greatly improved as well. But from there, the numbers leak away um, with too few choosing engineering courses in college um, and a significant dropout rate among women uh, during the courses. On graduation, many women choose, tend to choose non-traditional roles in engineering, which is fine, but, but you'd like to see a, a higher mix. And there is a high dropout rate uh, for those that do choose the, the traditional roles. So we, a, we have to better understand the reasons behind the leaky pipeline and to see what structural changes we can make to address those issues. Engineers Ireland can and must lead the way on this for the profession. And our sectors will play a central role here too, if we are to be successful. So Georgina, to respond, uh, looking at the team of the event, choose the challenge and what would I pick? I'm going to choose to challenge the sectors of Engineers Ireland. We're organized with about 30 sectors, regions, divisions, and societies. Um, and I challenge them all to actively promote gender balance on their committees. And I ask anybody who's here, here, here in the audience today to consider putting themselves forward to join our regional branches, the engineering divisions, our society committees, and become involved in the work of Engineers Ireland in promoting engineering to the next generation. Our sectors are the backbone of the organization. That's where the, the, the bulk of the membership have the chance to interact. Um, and they provide a wide variety of activities, including evening lectures and networking opportunities. And the chance to get involved has improved so much now with um, remote access and greater online participation on these events. So I myself have been involved in several committees and I must say it's very rewarding and it is the pathway to, to, to make these improvements. So new committees are elected every year and new members are always welcome. And it's just the right time of the year now because those of our sector AGMs will soon be on our website. They tend to happen in uh, early summer. So I would really encourage our female members to consider putting themselves forward for election to the, the sectoral committees and also for the Council of Engineers Ireland. Again, the, the election process will be starting soon. And if we can continue to have a high representation there, it's very good for the profession and it will really help us move forward. So thanks very much, Georgina. Hi, Georgina, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm Caroline Spillane. I'm the Director General of Engineers Ireland. And I have to say, it's just really a delight to be invited to join with all of you for this event today. I want to start off by thanking the Diversity Committee um, who are working under the chairmanship of Sarah Taxon um, and formerly um, with Magella Henshin, who was the inaugural chair of the committee for all of the work that they've been doing, as Morris has said, for the last couple of years. Um, a, a, um, you know, a lot of work behind the scenes really to get us to this point. And I want to congratulate you, uh, Georgina, on taking up the chairpersonship of this new group, a very important group. And I have to say, what a fantastic uh, group of colleagues you have on the committee and what an impressive lineup. And I know that we will have um, some fantastic uh, activities and events and, and recommendations. And I, I suppose as Director General, I want to give you a pledge that we will absolutely support everything that you're doing because the aims and objectives of what you're pursuing are really important. So, you know, I suppose International Women's Day, it uh, gives us an opportunity, doesn't it, to, to celebrate. Um, and it's important to celebrate the contribution of women to engineering, uh, not only in Ireland, uh, but internationally. And we have so many of uh, the members of Engineers Ireland and women who have trained as engineers in this country operating abroad. And we've very benefit, we, we really have benefited hugely in the last number of years from so many uh, women coming from other countries to work in the engineering industry in Ireland. And um, I suppose it's, uh, you know, it is a time when we are now very challenged economically, um, but it's very encouraging to see in our barometer report that as many as uh, just over 70% of female engineers 
feel confident about the opportunities that they have for a career in engineering here, and that's really fantastic. And uh, even better than that, 84% in the survey said that they found engineering to be a rewarding career choice. So that's very positive feedback from people who are practicing engineering. And I suppose on this International Women's Day, it's also important to take a little bit of time to reflect on how much has been achieved in terms of uh, so gender equality in the workplace and uh, that, that there is definitely a growing recognition that um, we have to ensure that uh, young girls and women have an equal opportunity to participate fully in the economy and um, to have equal uh, earning power and career choices. But um, on this day and given the context that we're in, I think we also need to think about redoubling our efforts because the, the fact of the matter is that uh, we are facing economic challenges and because of the pandemic we do know that probably women and girls are going to suffer more from this than any other group and that's been proven over and over again so the COVID crisis will impact on gender equality and and when I say we have to redouble our efforts I think that um, because of the pandemic and because of uh, the economic uh, welfare of the of the country, we, we do need to make sure that women and girls, particularly in this sector, aren't left behind. And so I think that that gives the committee uh, a very important platform uh, to work from um, because there is no room for complacency here. We definitely need to apply our thinking and our activities and our resources to this challenge. And so um, Morris mentioned there about uh, choosing to challenge, and I know that that's the theme of International Women's Day and thinking about what Morris has said, I certainly would support his call for women to think about, female engineers and members to think about participating on uh, various different committees of Engineers Ireland, um, including the executive board and the council, fantastic to see the change in the profile of representation of, of women at council and executive. Um, and then taking um, a step out from that, I suppose my choose to challenge uh, is all around uh, companies ensuring that they have representation on their boards and on their committee committees from, from women. I think that in, in selection processes, it's really important to be conscious of uh, biases and so that's why it's important to have good spread of balance on committees and interview panels um, so that it leads to an opportunity for women to take their place at the board table and uh, it really gives a very good and important signal for companies that they're willing to invest in their female engineers and to see them progress and so that's my choose to challenge on International Women's Day. Uh, as I said at the outset, great pleasure to be here. Um, this is a fantastic initiative and uh, I wish you all of the very best in everything that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, and thank you, Morris. It's fantastic um, to have you both here today to speak to us and fantastic to hear um, such great support um, from both of you, from Engineers Ireland in general for the group. Um, and I really liked what you're both going to challenge this year. Um, so thank you so much for that. I better say, uh, before I introduce the panel, I better say what I choose to challenge. Um, so I choose to challenge my husband, who owns his own construction company and runs it um, day to day. I choose him to challenge, to, I choose to challenge him to um, take on his half of the childcare role and the home life and the housework um, so that both of our careers can um, go forward um, equally. It can't always happen at the same time, but I challenge him to to, to step up to his 50%. And as the owner of a construction company, I challenged him to let his employees see him as a male boss, uh, leaving on time to collect the children or bringing them to the doctor and all of that. Um, so that's what I choose to challenge this year. Um, we'll have our panel discussion now. Um, the panel will be facilitated by Susan McGarry, who is um, in our committee. She's the industry liaison, and I've introduced her earlier. She's the Managing Director of Ecosem Ireland. Um, the panel today is um, Sarah Claxton, 
She's the Organizational Development Manager at ESB. She's a mechanical engineer with over 20 years experience. She has a master's in work and, work and organizational behavior from DCU. She is the chair of Engineers Ireland Inclusion and Diversity Group. And the other panelist is CJ Rudden. He's the chair of the construction sector group for innovation and dig digital adoption in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. He's a chartered engineer with over 40 years experience. He's a former president of Engineers Ireland. He's a former director of RPS. He's a fellow of many institutions and he's the founder and managing director of Ingus Consulting. So I would invite the panel to um, talk now till about half one um, and then we will have some questions and comments from the participants. So please, everyone, as we're going along, put in your questions and comments and I'll read them when the panel are finished. Thank you for the introductory introduction there, Georgina. Um, so I think we'll get started, Sarah, with yourself. So the ESB just last week published their report on gender pay gap within the organization. They've done this ahead of any um, legal requirement to do so. So can you give us some insight as to why um, they did this and, and how you went about doing it? Oops, sorry. Sorry, just I, I got a thing to say. I was on mute, but I'm not on mute. Hi, Susan. Hi, everybody. Georgina, I absolutely loved your very personal challenge, by the way. So uh, I think that's brilliant. Um, I hope your husband thinks so, too. Um, Susan, to answer your question, yeah, we have decided to go ahead and we did last week, we published, first we, we published internally first, um, uh, just about a week before we published externally. And then last Thursday, we actually published it externally. And um, while there isn't a, a legislative requirement to do so yet, there will be either at some stage later this year, but it's most likely going to be next year, 2022. Um, and the parameters around, you know, you know, what will be required to be published and, and the scale of organizations and all of that, I suppose that will be that will be revealed when, when that comes comes about. But it's already in place in the UK. And um, I suppose we just used what was in place in the UK to guide us in terms of what we published. And our reason for doing it ahead of time is that, yes, we have a gender pay gap. And I think um, other organizations have gone ahead and published their gender pay gap. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, to bring, I suppose, a renewed focus or re-energize this whole area of gender diversity. Um, because there is a, a thing called, uh, you know, gender fatigue, where we have been talking about this for quite a long time. You know, we've been focused on this for quite a long time. And, um, and yet we haven't got to that point yet where we can say, yes, we are all uh, existing and wonderfully um, inclusive and diverse organizations. And I suppose the thing that, that if you think about gender diversity, you know, oftentimes when we think about diversity, we think about minority groups, but females make up more than 50% of the world's population. Um, so that's not a minority. And yet we still see um, how that lack of, or that low levels of gender diversity and participation of females exists in many organizations and including ESB in terms of what we published last week. And I think from our perspective, um, I know from our perspective, what's driving our data is, um, is, is two things, really two key things. The first is, is engineering, uh, participation of women in engineering. 11% um, of our engineering population are females. Um, we are an engineering organization. So that is, a, that, that is a core confidence in our organization. And secondly, um, it's around the participation of women in, in senior leadership. It has improved enormously. So I looked at the data and five years ago, um, well, almost six years ago this year in 2015, our, our senior management was made up of 25% female. Uh, now it's 30%. So it is moving, things are changing, they are moving. Um, and I suppose that the one, the, the engineering aspect compounds the leadership aspect because as an engineering organization, many of our senior leaders come from that engineering background, which I think is a really positive thing for, for engineering as a discipline in general. And I think that is the case for many technical organizations. So I suppose that's why we have gone ahead, we've published, we're using it as an opportunity to really, you know, uh, give a shot in the arm to, to gender diversity and ESB. Um, and to, I suppose, at the same time, we've, we've developed our inclusion and diversity strategy. Gender diversity is right in the heart of that. 
So it's a really good time for us to kind of create those hooks around making change for the future. Yeah, and um, it's, as you said, the legislation is coming down the line. So I think an important thing to, to discuss is how can we, what can we do to, to leverage the, the what ESB have done and, and to be pioneers in the industry? What can everyone here today uh, take from that um, report and bring back into the organisation? Susan, I think you were asking me around what we can do um, around gender pay gap across the industry. And one of the things I'd say is that um, don't be afraid of gender pay gap. OK, and I think a lot of organizations have been maybe still are afraid of gender pay gap because maybe it draws attention um, to their diversity numbers and, you know, what's happening in their organization and all that. But I would say if you're if we're not afraid of it and we embrace it and we use it as an opportunity to challenge, this is the theme of International Women's Day this year to choose to challenge. Um, we'll actually use it then for what it was really intended, and that is to to drive forward uh, gender diversity in organizations. So I, I suppose if I was to challenge then other organizations out there, particularly um, employers of engineering, um, craft, like those those in the technical end of, of, of the business, to really uh, let's let's actually use this as a, as a platform to really inspire change over the coming years, more change, um, because it's the participation of women in engineering in particular is still too low. I mean, I think it's running around 15% um, and hasn't really shifted that much. I know UCD have done something particularly special in the last few years where they've they've taken a really focused approach, um, you know, working on feeder schools to, uh, to attract more females into engineering and that they have actually gotten the numbers up. And I think maybe that's the secret in a lot of organizations as well is to really take a you know group wide or a business wide focused approach, and I think that's what we need to do as an industry um, to really make the change that needs to happen. And um, PJ, we'll move to you. So I think from the the construction sector group that that you're the chairman of, you've identified quite a significant skills gap in the workforce um, that we need to basically deliver on our, our residential and our infrastructure projects over the coming year. So do you see encouraging more women into STEM careers as a way of bridging this gap? It's absolutely essential because there is a skills gap and the challenge is huge. Uh, National Development Plan uh, is a major ambition for the next 10 years. Uh, and 2040, uh, Project Down 2040, is to accommodate an, an additional 1 million people on this island. So there is a huge uh, infrastructural and housing uh, deficit uh, indeed, that, that deficit currently exists, let alone the, the growth in the, in the future economy, which hopefully will recover well after COVID. Uh, so that, 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 that skill gap is there, but it's not just the numbers. Uh, the new skills need to be aligned with the technological change that will be required to lift the country, uh, to build better, uh, faster, more economically than has been the case to date and to have a totally joined up uh, industry in terms of all of the professions, be the engineers, surveyors, architects, and, and the many people in service industry and the, and the supply chain. So there, not only is the, are, are the skills required, I mean, when I say skills, I mean the new skills that will be required in terms of better uh, next generation construction. Uh, we have to retrofit a whole lot of homes uh, we have to introduce not just level two BIM, but bring the full suite of BIM to play on an integrated project management approach. And uh, we have to look at sustainability and the requirement for uh, increased renewable energy and uh, uh, also the whole um, issue of modern methods of construction. Modern methods of construction is moving towards more modular construction using uh, off-site fabrication and all of that in controlled conditions, not out on a site that can be wet or cold or not conducive. And in terms of the whole uh, diversity and inclusion bit, uh, we, we really have a problem in, in that virtually half the population are not involved. Uh, low percentages from eight to 15% of, of the female gender. I mean, you know, uh, we want to get that up to 40% uh, 
ideally 50%. I was very fortunate in my career. I was blessed with 40% gender balance and, and never fell below 30%. And I can tell you, you reap a rich harvest from having an integrated uh, work, workforce and an integrated team of people that are, are complement, have complementary skills. I, I find that, you know, the, the male engineers uh, are, are fantastic technically. Uh, they're not as good as the females with the softer skills of communications and the whole sustainability agenda and communications, stakeholder engagement. They are the things that uh, make a project possible now. It's not the technical stuff anymore. That's a given. As you said, with the, the kind of change to, to the industry and, and um, adapting to more digital world, do you think digitalization of the industry um, has opened up more roles for women? Maybe this is for, for both PJ and Sarah to answer. Do you think that that traditional roles have changed in the construction industry and it's, it's more open now due to that digitalization? Absolutely. In terms of uh, certainly building information modeling, but also in terms of other areas uh, of sustainability where, uh, you know, it's, it, it requires as much environmental science as engineering. And that's for engineers and scientists to get together to, to help, uh, uh, you know, drive the, the, the climate action that is required. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to comment on that in terms of digitalization of industry? Yeah, like, like I hear, I often hear about this, you know, fourth industrial revolution. And, um, you know, I think that's really inspiring and brilliant, you know, to think about where we're at as a kind of society, as a race, a human race, you know. But we are very much in the digital era. And I think this last year through COVID has really shown us how much we are in that digital era, you know, how much, how, how far along. That has really accelerated everything, you know. And it has very much changed our ways of working and communicating. It has, to my mind, removed the kind of barriers to participation, inclusive participation in the workplace that existed before. Um, like many, many, most of us, I know I'm talking to you guys from my front room, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure everybody else is online from home, somewhere in their home as well. Um, and, you know, that's not going to change post COVID, you know, that the way in which we work and the way in which we communicate the relationships we build um, in our workplaces, that's all going to be very much dependent on digital. And it, it to, to me, that absolutely removes those barriers that were there in the past, you know, and we all know what those cultural barriers were around long hours culture, you know, um, always on, you know, no flexibility. And those are the things that really stopped women from continuing to participate and, and move up the leadership ranks. Um, because as, as, as we heard earlier on um, with Georgina's um, challenge, like, you know, you know, a life involves more than just work. There are many, many other jobs that we all have to do as well. And, you know, rebalancing the burden that way um, while at the same time changing ways of working through digital. Like it, to me, this is, we have a wonderful opportunity now you know, um, a once in a generation opportunity to really change things. So um, so it's there for the taking if we choose to do it, you know? Yeah, so the, this, one of the questions I had is that flexibility or asking for flexible working hours was always typically seen as something requested by the female workforce. It mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily something men asked for. Whereas now I think it has turned to quite a universal um, nearly entitlement everyone should have freedom to, mm. to not have to do a two-hour commute or, or do late yeah. hours if they have other commitments what do you both uh, think companies can do and senior leaders can do to improve that flexibility for both parents well you know the barriers um, uh, to, for diversity and particularly gender balance have to be removed I mean we're we're we've been fortunate by COVID isn't a welcome experience uh, it has, as, as Sarah says, um, uh, transformed the whole work-life balance in terms of you know, people having to work from home. And, uh, and that creates a much better synergy in the in, in home and with regard to home life. Uh, I do accept it doesn't necessarily change the childcare issue, but you know, I think uh, it, it should change it. And I very much welcome G Georgina's challenge to her husband in that regard. Um, those barriers are, you know, they're, they're, some of them are a fallacy. 
that um, that uh, you know that females can't do engineering. That's completely wrong, and I'll come back to that later. And uh, Susan and PJ, just. Um... I suppose from, from my own experience in an ESP context, and I think that's something that actually is important from a societal and cultural perspective now at the moment is that now in this day and age, men are much more involved, want to be much more involved um, in their children's upbringing. You know, um, we're seeing lots of organizations now who are doing paid uh, paternity leave. Many, many organizations, well, many, a few a handful of organizations like real leaders in the area are um, paying full six months paternity leave for 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 men for men for, for for dads, and I think that really that there that combined with the technology changes, you know, there's a huge opportunity in all of that, because making our workplaces more inclusive for everybody, you know. So as you said, Susan, it was always very much considered, you know, um, and and look, we all have that experience where it was it was mostly working mothers who were looking for that flexibility for very good reason. But now more and more with, with greater participation of men in their children's lives, both parents can, can benefit from that and like create that balance and that work-life integration that's really necessary to help people stay um, engaged in the workplaces. And I think from a workplace perspective, post-COVID, I think organizations need to be thinking about what does your culture look like um, in the future? Like if we all accept that, you know, the collective madness of everybody, all of us getting into our vehicles, um, you know, or jumping onto public transport at the same time in the morning, commuting to an office where we invariably logged on to check emails. I've heard that described as a, a form of collective madness. I think that's a really good way of putting it. That actually, in, in the, if we accept that, you know, remote and flexible working is going to play a bigger role, how do we make sure that we manage our cultures so that we don't end up with a two-tier organisation? So I suppose to think about, will, will the experience for people who choose to work remotely or from home and um, who choose flexibility, you know, will, will their experience be lesser than those who are in the office? Will we still create that center of power that's in the, you know, the workplace or will we get the culture right? And I suppose that requires leaders across organiza organizations to live it, to, to be the models of a new way of working, you know, and um, because if all of the senior leaders go back to the office, then everybody will look at that and say, well, they're all back in the office. I need to be back in the office. And then we will create that in inequality of experience. So that's the that's the thing I think that a lot of organizations need to be thinking about at the moment. It's certainly what we're thinking about. Yeah, I know for, from my own point of view and in, and in Ecosem, it's something that we did discuss. What are we going to do after this? I don't mm. think we will ever want to make everybody come back into the office five days a week. However, you do have to bring in that social aspect to it. If people yeah. want to chat, they want to meet. So if you had one or two days where those are office days, sign your invoices, have your team meetings, and then you're free to, to work remotely where, where you need to be. And um, so that's something positive that we're trying to bring in because I think it was in the summer last year when restrictions were kind of lifting, we, we did offer maybe people need a break from home. Maybe they want to come into the office and we had a quote of, I think eight people per day were allowed into our offices and no one took us up on it. So that just showed you that people were happy. They're happy working from home. Um, and they're getting their work done and we're seeing increases in productivity. So it's something that we'd like to keep going in the future, but you have to get everybody on side and you have to get everybody seeing the benefits of that. And um, there is one thing that, that I think it comes up all the time when people talk about gender balance is how do you help improve gender balance in an organization without some of the more negative things, you know, like positive discrimination or gender quotas. You want to avoid those kind of things. It, it should be right person for the right job, but also how do you improve the amount of applicants you have or having a balanced short list of candidates? Well, I, I think um, you've got to generate the culture that um, is obvious looking at the company or the organization. Uh, Unfortunately, you need something like uh, a threshold of about 30% to be self-perpetuating. But to create that, uh, you know, there are various opportunities on the way, say, second level education with work experience. Um, you know, uh, stories of, about, about engineering. And it's not just about STEM. Uh, you know, there's as much STEAM to it as STEM. And you know what the STEAM is? It's the A, arts arts and humanities. It's not all DYDX, even in STEM. 
it's it's about the human experience of making the world a better place. More, if, if any profession can say, uh, you know, who makes the world go round? What single profession makes the world go round? It's, it's lots of professions, but mostly engineers. Mind you, engineers created a lot of the problems of climate, uh, um, requiring climate change, but we, we certainly now have to sort them out. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's also um, this, the situation that it's the engineering profession that will, that will drive climate change and climate action to resolve climate change. Because what it's about, it's about mostly combination of electricity, heat and transport. They're all engineering aspects. And uh, so that there, not only um, do we need an improved diversity and gender balance, but the very emergency that we have now in the country in terms of post COVID, the next emergency is climate. And it, it requires a, a combination of innovation and digitization, which I think, uh, you know, females will do as well as, if not even better than, than the males will. And the, I, I've seen this throughout my career. Uh, they're, they're, they're way more sensitive to human issues. And it is human issues now that we have to address. Uh, so I think there's a, a huge opportunity for the profession going forward to lead. And I agree with uh, Sarah, it's a leadership issue. The, and, and there needs to be more females at leadership level. They're coming up some brilliant people, but they're, they're not, you know, they're not up there yet in time. But, you know, I was always somebody to send to, uh, you know, skip a generation with leadership. And that's how you do it. You're probably a good example of that yourself, Susan, skipping a generation uh, to MD. And you don't have to wait for progression. Those days are gone. It's now the best person to do the job who will inspire the workforce and, and a diverse workshop, workforce increasingly. Very good. Thanks very much, PJ. I'd like to think I'm I'm paving the way for, for um, female leaders in the cement industry, which is notoriously uh, gender um, unbalanced at the moment. Um, I think an important point that you mentioned there is making the make companies being attractive to candidates and the profession itself being an attractive place for female candidates, that they can obviously fight climate change and follow kind of that human passion side of things. Um, what Morris mentioned earlier on is the dropout rate is very high with women. So we do see more uh, girls taking on um, school subjects around STEM, entering maybe engineering courses or construction courses, but then that leaky pipeline between graduation to being a junior member of staff, there is quite a significant drop off there. Um, what can the industry do to kind of get people at that stage and, and say, just stay in here, you know, keep going. It is a worthwhile career. You are going to get fulfillment out of it. Just hang on in there. What's the issue there, do we think? Make it more exciting. Uh, some of them do go into business go and go into other areas of even, you know, anything from accountancy. Some of them even go off and do uh, biomedical and go into medicine. But if engineering is, is exciting enough, we'll be able to retain, uh, you know, we'll be able to stop the leaky pipe. We've got to make it exciting and we've got to make it more relevant. And there isn't enough media coverage of what engineers do, other than through the brilliant Engineers Week and steps at, a, at an education level. But we have to go out there that not only do we make the world go round, we can change the world. And there's very few professions can do that. Yeah, Sarah, do you want to make a yeah, comment? Yeah, Susan, um, can we come back to the quota question? Because yes. I have a view on that, okay, right, okay. And it has evolved, my view on quotas has evolved, right? So, but I think it's worth sharing. Um, I think, in, like you talked about um, women in particular, uh, you know, maybe, through college or between college and that early career, maybe stepping out of engineering. I, I wouldn't be surprised if what's going on there is their lived experience so um, of the workplace and the inclusive aspects of the culture that they have experienced, which kind of is not attractive, you know? So, and look, I think any of us who have been around long enough, um, of, who have worked in engineering uh, long enough could identify with that, those times where it, 
it wasn't exactly the most welcoming, you know, in the world, like, you know, and, and I think that is a really, really important uh, focus. So organizations like you talked about, what do we need to do? Like we need to focus on our intake, you know, and some of that is outside of the control of, of organizations and maybe is more in the control of the likes of all of us here together in terms of Engineers Ireland and the industry. How do we um, attract more women, more girls at primary school level to take science subjects, keep them engaged through secondary school, you know, um, keep them engaged through college, mentor and, you know, be, provide role model and support for them as they come into the workplace. So, so there's, there's, to me, there's something of an industry aspect to that. And there's a, that STEPS program that Engineers Ireland manage is fantastic. You know, leveraging that around getting um, more traction with, with girls because at that very young age um, uh, and, and keeping them engaged. So that's, that's one thing. So we're all, because we're all trying to target the same 15% of females that are coming out of engineering, all the engineering companies are like, you know, so, um, so that's, that's part of it. Then um, the inclusion bit, every organization has got to work on that at the same time. And I, and I have said this, that, um, you know, I think there was a time in the past where everyone focused on diversity and then inclusion was this other thing, but now it's flipped and it's like focus on inclusion, it's inclusion and diversity because inclusion drives better diversity, you know, um, and unless we are as organizations focusing on that and shifting that mindset, um, you know, so that that lived experience is really positive, you know, then we are going to continue to lose people, you know, lose women. Um, so um, women and other minority groups, you know, so it, so, it, it, you know, coming to work and having a clear set, a really good sense of belonging and being part of a team and knowing that you're valued for what you do, like that's so important psychologically to all of us in the workplace, you know. So I, I've, I've written down for myself how we work as an organization, what we value, you know. Um, and then the last bit is around how we ensure that we uh, manage those processes in our organization that influence you know, development of leadership and all of that through the, through the organization. Really, really important that we're doing that with a diversity lens in place, you know. Um, so, so, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination of things, but I think what you just, when you described there about, you know, how are we losing them? I think that has to do with lived experience, you know, so, um, and I think that that starts all the way back in college, in university, do you know, what's that lived experience like? Is it harder to be a female in a large group of males studying engineering than it is to be a male you know and then if you add in the other kind of like it gets more 50 percent of the population are women we've said that already but when we talk then about other areas of diversity how much harder is it to be then if you're a woman and you're also a person of color you know um or if you're a woman and you're also lgbt like you know so it starts to become much more complex so inclusion i think is is really really key and something that organizations really need to focus on yeah, I think that the, the mentorship that you mentioned there is one way of really helping to drive that inclusion ag agenda. We talked about in our first meeting as the Women in Engineering group um, that that's something that we would like to, to bring in because we had 30 women on the call and I've never been in a, in a committee group or any sort of meeting like that where there was so much enthusiasm because everyone said, this is the first time I've been in a meeting in my career with this many women. Like mm. it was just such a novelty to be surrounded by yeah, people that absolutely. might be looking for act like you. So I think mentorship is a really, really important thing because it can be difficult to be the only woman in the room. And as well as you're, you're trying to normalize the fact, I know I'm trying to normalize the fact that I'm in this job and this is my career and it's, it's completely yeah. normal that I'm here. A lot of the time it's not normal that I'm there. I do stand out. I am the only woman in the room. And I do mm -hmm. think differently to the other people because we're, we're all different. Um, so I think mentorship is something that this group can do um, quite successfully to, to help the industry. And we've uh, certainly got a lot of enthusiastic women mm. in the group that want to get involved. Um, yeah, and young women really need that, I think, just as they make that trend, is, uh, as they make the choice to take on engineering as a third level area of study, but also as they leave college and come into the workplace, they really do need that, you know, so yeah. We might actually move to some of the questions from the audience there. I'll get Georgina to help me with this part to pull out a few questions. So if anyone has any further questions, please pop Susan, them in. Susan, can I, can, I, can, yeah. I, can I put my two bits worth in around quotas? Absolutely. One of my, uh, I'd say least favorite topics, but look, I, 
I have had mixed views around, and my views have evolved around quota, okay? I was very much against them. And I think I was against them as an engineer, a female engineer who was like, I don't want to be a quota, <laughs> do you know? But I would say, um, and I I'd said but, so it's important I say what's after that. So I would say though, that they have their role. And we have seen that in the, in the political end of things, how it was really, really slow to change. And then quotas were put in place and that has really shifted, you know, it's a right shifting mindsets, you know, and sometimes you do need that starter to kind of move things on. Um, I think in organizations, it, it, like it's probably, you know, there are quotas around boards and that, like, you know, but um, certainly in organizations, I think it's more around targets, setting yourself really clear targets and pipelines and, how, and around how you manage that so that, you, so that we don't find ourselves in the space of actually having to resort to quotas. But um, I wouldn't dismiss them either, though. I mean, that's one of the things that I, I suppose I've my thinking has evolved around that, that they do have a, a role, they do have a place, um, and it just really depends on how much progress is being made. Yeah, a lot of the time things need to change so that they can change. So yeah. if that's something that needs to be yeah. done to, to create that change naturally later on, then, then that's what we need to do. Yeah. Um, Georgina, do you want to start with um, me? Yeah, just so we just to let you know because you, you haven't been reading the I have a great discussion going on in, in the in the question and answer um box here. Um so I'll just ask you to answer as quickly as you can, maybe so we can get to as many as we can. Um and people are even um answering each other's questions too, which is brilliant great. here. Yeah. Um so if you don't mind, actually, I'll answer the first one. <laughs> this person anonymous says why would a wet and cold site deter women more than men from being on site uh, <laughs> and I mean in my experience it wouldn't like the, the my favorite part of my job is the days that I'm on site and even though I'm in consulting design I'm working for a contractor and and so half my working life was a uh, consulting for a design office and then the last 12 years has been for a contractor and that's why I love what I'm doing now um and okay I don't have many women that I work with on site but the ones that I do love being there um so yeah in my experience that that there's no difference there um Georgina no no such thing as bad weather just bad clothing <laughs> the wrong clothing yeah yeah exactly exactly and I find my my first boss in this job was from New Zealand and he was very much into marketing and he always made sure that my name was on everything so like not only am I the woman who stands out I'm the woman who has her name on her hat and her jacket and her gloves and <laughs> so people know me from a mile off on site um, the next question is from another anonymous person and they say gender pay gap in general is less in control of individual organizations because they are influenced by maternity leave taxation models child care costs share of child care with couples etc what's in direct control of organizations is ensuring that two equal employees get the same pay whether male or female women have been proven to be less for comfortable challenging their salaries so it's not reasonable to put the onus on employees what can we do to improve this can i can i georgina answer that one um or to give a view on that right and i think maybe to um, alleviate some confusion maybe so gender pay gap is not the same as equal pay so equal pay so equal pay is about paying a man or a woman differently to do the same job based on gender and that's actually illegal in ireland um so i'm assuming that there's no companies on on the call here who are organ people with organizations who are doing that so so that's equal pay whereas gender pay gap is where you literally take all of the pay of all of the men in your organization you add it up and divide it by the number of men you do the same for the women it's the average so it's you're finding the average pay of male and the average pay of women and you're comparing both and then expressing the pay gap as a percentage, women's pay is the, the difference as a percentage of men's pay, okay? Um, so it is not about individuals and what, uh, you know, it, it, it is about the organization. It really speaks to your diversity. So the split that you have between male and female, you know, who is occupying the most highly paid jobs, male or female, so at leadership level, those jobs that um, have access to overtime and additional learnings and shift and that. Um, if some organizations have 50-50, they have, 50% balance between men and women, 
Um, but when you look at their gender pay gap, it's huge. And that's because the women are in the lower paid contact center jobs and the men are in the more professional roles or in the um, in the leadership roles. So so really gender pay gap just tells the story of your um, your diversity in your organization from a gender perspective. Does that answer that one, yeah. Regina? Yeah. yeah, that's cool. um Orla says, I worry that when I hear generalizations like PJ's comment about women being better at soft skills, complimentary though it is, would it be better to say that maybe women are conditioned or taught to be better at this when really we need to educate men in this area as well? And maybe that's a society wide issue rather than specific to engineering. Uh, th th there's a grain of truth and more than a grain of truth in what she says. Uh, the issue about soft skills is more about emotional intelligence than anything else, in fact. And, you know, so, and that's a personal thing to both men and women. Um, the, but, you know, the organisational aspects of, say, stakeholder engagement and communications, um, uh, you know, I, I, in my experience that, that uh, you know, female engineers uh, are, are better at project management, are better at team building, are better at, you know, maybe I'm, I'm biased, uh, overly biased because of my own uh, fairly good experience. Um, but it was an experience that was good for business, I can tell you. It was a very good, it was very good for business. And I would say that the gender balance in the company I was in was a key enabler in driving us forward to be leaders in the industry. And it wouldn't have happened had that gender uh, diversity happened. And it wasn't engineered. It happened purely because, uh, uh, you know, the best people were employed on the day. For uh, the best applicant was employed. And so there was no magic bullet to it. It happened because if, you, if you're absolutely fair and straight about this, this is how it transpired. I'm not saying that every company is like this or every group of people is like this, but I can tell you that, uh, you, you know, that's, you know, the various years that graduate year on year from the various uh, schools and colleges throughout the country, it's a small country. And if, if a company gets a reputation for hiring uh, female engineers or technologists or you know architects or anything else uh, they that company will get an awful lot more applications from that quarter and even you know when they sit in reception and see the people coming and going they, they it, it, it it it'll click very fast and it uh, you know success begets success in this field and i you know i don't think i was as lucky as I was saying earlier, it happened because we were open to it. And that's- and PJ, PJ, maybe as well, it's something around, like if you think about management as a technology, um, there was a time when command and control was the technology, you know, um, and that has evolved hugely over time as well, you know? So maybe we've created the kind of um, the scenarios where we in the past where softer skills weren't valued um, and now that whole emotional intelligence and, you know, the ability to lead in a different way is, and, you know, maybe that's just what's going on there. But certainly there, are, there is research around um, the role that transformational leadership plays in organizations now and how important it is and how um, there is research that shows that women are naturally more better at that than men. But that doesn't mean that all women are good at that and all men are bad at that. Yeah. I sometimes think about gender as an attitude as well, because um, I know some fantastic um, male leaders that I work with and they have those, you know, empathetic leadership skills in spades. And I think that's what makes them so brilliant as leaders, you know. So Orla, I, I, I hear what you're saying there. And I suppose what myself and PJ are saying is that like, you know, organizations have evolved and what we valued in the past is different to what we're valuing now. And we're valuing that more um, transformational style and that, you know, empathetic style of leadership. I think Sarah puts it well, and in fact, you know, I've some 40 years experience behind me and I can say in the earlier part of my career, there was command and control. I can tell you that doesn't work for the males either. No command and control is gone. So if you want to build a business, a successful one, you can forget that one. 
I think there's some really good questions coming in there, Georgina. They're, they're kind of similar around COVID and the pandemic um, about flexible working hours, but it can often mean turning on the laptop at 8 p.m. instead of working late in the office. Or there's an aspect of being always on because, you're yes, you're working from home, but the laptop basically follows you everywhere. Has there been... I think there was an EU report on this that the, the COVID pandemic and working from home has negatively affected women in a disproportionate way to men. Is that something that, that either of you have seen in, in your work? Anna, yes, it has. It, it is, Susan. Actually, there is research mostly in the States actually around how many women have stepped out of the workforce because of the stresses of, um, you know, at home schooling, you know, working from home and just couldn't couldn't do everything. So there is that kind of need for organizations to make it possible for men and women to participate, have that work-life integration, then it works for everybody, it works better for everybody. Um, there, is, there is new legislation coming down the line as well in terms of the right to disconnect, um, you know, uh, remote working strategy from the government. So look, I think that we all left, packed up our offices and left, um, got our digital switched on from home, I think we're still learning about how to do that really effectively. I know in ESB we are, um, and we're identifying that actually having meetings wall to wall all day long uh, make, means that people are having to you know, work, trying to do other things at different times. So we're starting to, just this week, we've announced no meetings for, on Wednesday afternoons from 12 noon until um, close of business. And that's just to give the organization a chance to take a, a kind of a, a, a deep breath, pause, and catch up on other stuff, you know, that is not um, meetings. I think there's a, a heavy dependence on meetings in working culture. And I, I think that with all the technology that will shift to more what's called asynchronous. So using chats and, you know, uh, uh, web po podcasts and stuff like that so that people can do it when it suits them. Um, and that and not everything depends on meetings. So I think we're learning. I don't know who asked that question, but whoever it was that asked that question, I think you're right. And I think that all organizations were learning and we just need to keep the learning going around how's the best way to work, you know, so that yeah, we all yeah. have this brilliant experience. Yeah, we do. The, 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 one, the, the one difference on. I would, I would uh, detect is that, uh, you know, both male and female are impacted by, by the stress of COVID. Um, I think the female uh, will, will walk away quicker than the man. And, and probably rightly so, if they can't, you know, uh, if they think it's, it shouldn't be happening. Uh, the guys will complain, but they, they won't walk away. And I think that's just a, that's a matter of physiology more than anything else. It's not a matter of individual choice. It's, it's um, the, you know, I'm not saying that uh, females have less endurance, uh, uh, but in, in, the, in that particular case of COVID, I have experience of both complaining, uh, but I mean, I've heard more males complaining than females, frankly. Um, and, but they, they, they stay with it for, for punishment or whatever, you know. Whereas you think yeah. a woman would walk away maybe a bit quicker. And rightly, and rightly so, and rightly so. Yeah, but that could be contributing to our, us, to, to women then being less visible in the workplace because a woman, Probably has no choice. She has to step away because there's a child screaming for dinner, <laughs> you know. But, but that's um, terrible. It shouldn't happen. No, it, no, it shouldn't. And um, but yeah, I mean that's what we need to try and challenge. And that's my challenge is to get my husband to you know acknowledge that in my career is just as important as his. And sometimes he has to come home and make the dinner and let me stay at work. Um, so yeah, I mean we do, we do, we've a lot to learn. I do know some companies who are fin tell uh, asking their employees to log off a little bit early on a Friday and go for a walk and you can only log off if you go for the walk <laughs> they're not they're going to know but um we are learning around that um there's other companies that like you Sarah um no meetings on a Friday um if possible um I did hear Arthur Cox talking about this in terms of a legislative um thing that if the world turns more towards virtual work um, they are a little bit worried that in our space in Ireland, we're very much linked to foreign direct investment and doing virtual meetings with countries which are not in our time zone. Um, so if Europe was to bring in this um, right to log off, you know, working hours in terms of legislation, that it would be a problem for Ireland to do business if you had to let your employees log off at a certain time because 
some employees just have to have meetings with Australia or America, or whatever. So Arthur Cox are saying that they hope, you know, it, it doesn't go down a legislative route, but we do need to build a culture where it's okay to not reply to texts, you know, after a certain time at night. And okay, you might have to have a meeting, but um, it, it's all about culture. Um, yeah, Georgina, that's a really good point because um, most of us who work in engineering organizations, um, they're the type of work that we do, it's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So we always have people, we don't, we're not going to switch off servers because we need them, you know, when, when those people need them for whatever emergency that they're dealing with. But I think there's, um, I think the right to disconnect will drive policies within organizations, which are, you know, focused on well-being. Um, and if somebody does have meetings with somewhere in the US or, you know, in Asia, um, uh, in a different time zone, that's fair enough, provided they're not also working the, you know, it's about that long hours thing. So I think maybe with the, um, the you know, right to disconnect should come a policy on common sense in every organization as well around how you actually make that work, you know? So, um, but I think there is definitely, a, I heard at a conference the other day that every organization needs to be a healthcare organization because well being is the thing that every organization needs to be thinking about. You know, um, it's the thing that connects every single one of us from the CEO to the person at the front line. Well-being is important to every single person in the organization. So organizations do need to do things uh, and bring focus to that, you know, and support employees to maintain it. Yeah. Yeah. I might just, yeah. I might just like to comment, uh, Georgina, uh, just according to me from what Sarah was saying. Um, I, I'm a judge at the Irish Construction Awards. Uh, I was last year anyway. And on construction sites, I was quite amazed at the attention that the bigger well-resourced contractors are putting into well-being. And there isn't a major company now that doesn't have at least one or two or three nurses and perhaps a doctor available for well-being complaints. And I won't say complaints, issues. Mm. It's such a major issue. In fact, it's, it's almost overtaking uh, last year, anyway, when we looked at it, it's almost overtaken health and safety as an issue, the whole issue of well-being and mm -hmm. mental health, and and the and the the amount of infrastructure being put in place now by the larger contractors who obviously have the resources to do it to deal with possibilities of mental health and uh, take it for granted. You walk safely, you go home safely. Not always the case, and you know there's a certain level of of seriousness and sadness about all of this. And uh, we shouldn't discount uh, the absolute criticality of uh, well-being and, and uh, mental health. And the, the, you know, the working from home and all of that helps that situation, I hope, enormously, because some people on sites uh, were highly stressed. And I don't think people appreciate it outside their immediate um, circle that that was the case. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mental health is it's it is a huge issue. And I do see a lot of campaigns on site, you know, it's okay to talk and um welfare mental health officers and that, which is is fantastic. Um I'll go to a question here. Noreen Delaney asks, um, what is the most common answer when asking women what stops them for choosing engineering? Uh, to study engineering or pursue a career in engineering? What's the most common reason people give for not doing it? Usually maths. That's what they'll say. Yeah, um, from my experience, um, doing talks in schools or dealing with kind of uh, secondary school level kids, it's just not on their radar. Engineering is not a profession they'd look at as something that they want to do. It just doesn't occur to them. And that is because of the bias around the the role in itself what is an engineer they don't see that as a woman in that position it's just not what's pushed out there from an early age so it's not what they see it's the very important thing if she can see it she can be it the more normalized it becomes that there's a woman engineer engineer means man or woman the more likely it is to become a career choice in their head but for for me in the past kind of five years of of my career uh, doing talks in schools and, and meeting um, younger girls and trying to encourage them into the career, it's just not on their radar. It doesn't occur to them. So there's a there's a solution in what you're saying there, Susan, isn't there? Like if 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 young 
women could see much more girls even at that school age could see um, more role models it changes their perspective we've seen that with the craft um, we've had huge success which I never thought we would hand on heart um, you know our, our electrical apprenticeship program uh, we now get about 12 out of 70 we want to push those numbers up coming into our apprenticeship program who are women and that's phenomenal like we know there were there were many many years where there were none you know um it's 99 percent male you know there are many organizations who hire apprentices and still have no um female apprentices so there's um using using the profile profiling and actually the role modeling um potential of our of the women that we do have sending them into schools to talk about what they do and how fulfilling their roles are as 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 network technicians and apprentices apprentices has completely shifted um because young women can see themselves in other young women you know whereas they find it really hard to see themselves in a 48 or 52 year old man like you know so um so it's it's something really powerful that role modeling and i wonder is that the key to mobilizing you know, engineering as a profession and attracting more females. Yeah, I think it's very important as well because it relates to another question there. There's a, from Magellan that a, an excellent point on inclusiveness of the lived experience. I'm working 30 years as an engineer and I've only found a real female engineering network in the last three years. And can the group launch today provide that network? Like th that's exactly what we aim to do with the women engineering group. Like for me, even in the, the first call that we had, it was there was women more senior than me I don't see that in my career right now in my company that that's not there so for me to see it makes me go oh okay that this is a normal path to take so then vice versa younger girls seeing me as a managing director can in the engineering sphere can lead them to to take on that as a career choice so it's it's a network group that's very visible. So show all of the, the women that we have in this group, let them talk about their experience for the younger generation and also help the other women in, within the group to see kind mm. of here, the people just slightly ahead of you are doing, or even learn from those coming up the ranks because there's that reverse mentorship thing that you can do where you can learn from mm. your group experience. Yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Magella, lovely to have you here, Magella. Um, Magella makes another point there. She says, can we challenge our male engineer leaders to act as role models for other men to be seen as being equal partners with mothers in raising children and looking for flexible uh, working hours so that it's not just a mommy thing? Um, now we know we, we did address this, but um, it would be great, wouldn't it, to challenge our, our male leaders to... Um, to profile themselves and show what I took a year off. I work yeah. a four day week. Yeah. Well, Magella, Magella raises the very issue uh, that I have chosen for, choose the challenge. And I know it's premature for me to say it, but I might as well say it. I want to challenge the men because if the majority of men taught, like I think we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think it's very important. Male allies are hugely important in the industry. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. Susan. And there, and let's call a spade a spade. Um, all of our all of the organisations we're talking about do not have gender balanced leadership. So that means we need those men who are at the top of organisations to really. I suppose there is a group called Men Advocating Real Change. We need men to advocate for real change in this. Um, you know, to to want it for their own businesses. Um, to want it for you know, their own children and, you know, the future, the next generation or whatever else. So um, there is, yeah, there's huge, and I, I actually think, Magella, um, you know, that's it's one of the big risks that we've put out there is the post-COVID working um, culture, and it will be how our leaders actually model um, these new ways of working, this use of flexibility, like people have to see them doing it. So it's, it's definitely on the table. Another anonymous person here says, what about older women wanting to come back to engineering now that it's not as bad as it was in the 90s? Are employers taking 50 year old female graduates? Um, and is it worth going back to college to retrain and update your skills? 
I might answer that. I wouldn't, I, I don't think the, the age part really has anything yeah. to do with them. If, if I was recruiting somebody, it wouldn't really be applicable. It would be, what can you bring to the business to fulfill the role that we're doing? And I think if you were talking about retraining or upskilling uh, just to, to get up to speed um, in the time that you've been away from the industry, my two main things would be digitalization and sustainability. That's where yeah. the world is going. It's where Ireland is going at quite a rapid pace. We were quite slow to start, but it's moving now. Um, we can see a lot of different industry bodies are publishing their carbon roadmaps. We see a huge amount of movement with BIM and standardization. So those would be my two kind of pieces of advice for you to, to get familiar with sustainability and digitalization. And, you know, I, I saw a statistic, Susan, the other day that over 800 million jobs will be displaced worldwide because of automation. Um, but more than that will be created, you know, um, in the it, it, because of because of digital, you know. Yeah. So um, so there's a huge opportunity in that. So there's nobody like it used to be that uh, I remember hearing this, that a, a degree and in, 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 a degree in engineering would give you a career for 35 years. But now it gives you less than five you know so because technology is changing at a huge rate so everybody has to remain upskilled like nobody everybody has to keep their skills up to date so yeah absolutely agree that it's I think reskilling is going to become a bigger feature of how individuals work but and also how organizations actually completely um keep their capability in line with what they're trying to do as an organization what their strategy is it's a lot of it's going to be in that out learning and development space reskilling yeah yeah i i absolutely agree too because um uh i agree with what uh, susan's take on the two issues digitalization and sustainability you know the role i have is about uh, innovation and digitalization but in fact innovation is 90 percent now sustainability and, and driving sustainability. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that uh, um, women returning to engineering is one of the uh, groups that we spoke about in our first meeting um, network group, um, because we would hope that there would be women female engineers out there who would like to get back in that maybe we could help them um, be a stepping stone to that and it would be a safe space for them to talk to other engineers and see how you know what kind of discipline would they like to go back to maybe they studied one discipline and they might like to go back to a completely different discipline and hopefully we could help with that um, and also like that, that person there mentions a 50 year old woman I mean we're all going to be working till we're I don't know, 70, 75. Mm -hmm. My first boss retired recently and he's in his 80s. Um, you know, so, I mean, engineering by its nature, it's not an ageist profession, I would think, because, um, well, I, I see a lot of engineers just not retiring at all. <laughs> or maybe they retire and go on to something else. So, I mean, they say everyone has at least three careers. So, why not why not mm. change profession you know it's a it's a boring life if you do the same thing forever um uh john reddy here asks um great to see the engineers ireland salary survey have a marginal bias towards females in year one of employment um some points along the age scale need to improve but my question is what is the panel's view on how to make engineering more attractive to female stem students um, to choose engineering as opposed to science and medicine, because that would be quite popular for women, for girls, I suppose. Um, well, I think the answer to that is um, Kennedy Brothers, who said that, you know, uh, scientists see things how, they, as they are and ask why engineers dream of things that aren't and ask why not. And I, and I think Georgina, um, I think engineering as a profession is very misunderstood. Like many people don't, outside of engineering, children in school, their parents, their teachers don't understand what engineers do. Um, and I think that's maybe down to us. And, you know, how do we actually, you know, demonstrate that and back to Susan's point, provide the role models um, and actually show in a really, as, as PJ was saying earlier on, um, you know, the things that engineers do 
are really interesting, especially in a modern world, especially in a world that's really grappling with the whole climate change um, uh, agenda. You know, the role of engineers is really significant in all of that. But are we the best um, narrators of our own story? Like, you know, probably not. So I think we, we do need to help understand what, um, what is engineering. Yeah, I think the engineering profession needs to hire a marketing consultant <laughs> yeah. to be your, the, the, the yeah. profession. Yeah. I did Women's Day, um, I think it was a couple of years ago with TU Dublin, they ran an event with Access Schools. Um, so it was a group of um, transition year and fifth year girls. So they were kind of in that, the midst of making their decisions of what subjects to study or they had already done and they're thinking about their CAO. And I thought, what, a, what can I do differently here to show what I do because my career has not been a typical engineering career but it's the most varied and interesting career I could have ever imagined and I wake up every day going I'm quite excited for what the day brings ahead every day is different I was doing a huge amount of travel at the time in my group sustainability role so I took a risk and I showed a slide of me at lots of different events and hosting things and it was just anything but the typical image of an engineer and there was one of me with my hard hat my high vis on site in the plant doing a safety check so yes I do do that your typical image but I also do this wealth of other stuff that's very interesting and very fulfilling and the response was quite good to it like the, the girls kind of as I said it wasn't on their agenda like I didn't mm. really realize what an engineer was I didn't understand so it's it's doing that it's showing it from a different aspect it's just kind of getting your PR right and, and highlighting the good side of things. Yeah, yeah uh, that, absolutely. that reminds me of a story that, um, you know, uh, I'd say for the second half of my career, I spent a lot of time doing what they call the, the milk run around the colleges to, if you like, sell or market the company. And, um, and I, I used to ask graduates who did come into the company, uh, why did they join us? And they said, you were the only one that came into college and ended the last couple of slides of all the parties you were having. <laughs> and I said, I found the other stuff, all your lovely projects, utterly boring. But for you, you were, nobody else did that but you. And that's why I'm here. That's, <laughs> I do agree. I think we need a marketing team um, to market us maybe better. Um, <laughs> It's nearly two o'clock now, so I'm very sorry to any questions and comments we didn't get to, um, but we will read them and they will inform what we do for our next events. Um, I'm going to end by asking the three panelists, actually, I'll just um, ask you all to join our group on LinkedIn if you're not uh, with us already. And uh, please comment on the event on um, social media. Um, we are hashtag WE group and hashtag IWD International Women's Day. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I've really, really enjoyed it and I hope you have too. We're going to have, we plan to have three more events this year. And so I will just invite the three of you to please say what you choose to challenge this year. Uh, I'll, I'll kick off. So I choose to challenge my own company. We pitch ourselves as leaders and pioneers in the industry. Um, but we're still only at 25% of the female workforce across the group in Europe. So we have done a, a good bit so far over the past four years, but we can clearly do more. So I'm choosing to challenge my own company. What else can we do to improve that, that balance? Um, I'm choosing to challenge um, all of us organizations that are out there in this um, engineering space to really, you know, don't be afraid of gender pay gap. Um, use it to drive change in your organization um, and, and see where it takes us. See if we can actually re-energize and, you know, um, give a shot in the arm to this whole area of gender diversity. I choose to challenge the men uh, in a leadership position to um, do what we're doing here today and, you know, uh, op open the doors and open the windows to 50% gender balance, 50% diversity, inclusion. And uh, just a little plug before I go, when you're on LinkedIn uh, joining this group, would you mind also joining the CSC uh, Innovation and Digital Adoption Group because that's next generation uh, construction. And this, uh, the symbol or the logo to it is Newgrange that was built by the engineers of Ireland 
minus 3000 BC. And, you know, mm. there was no BIM or, or um, EDM in those days, uh, but the sun comes into that chamber at the same time every, every December. So we're building, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. Thank you. Well said. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. And who knows, there was probably women engineers there 3,000 years ago. We just don't know about them, but I'm sure they were there. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Uh, follow PJ's group, follow Ecosem, and follow ESB on social media as well. Um, thank you all, uh, our panellists. You've given your time freely, and we really, really appreciate it. And so thanks all participants for giving your time. I know it's not easy with family life and everything to give up your lunchtime, um, but we really appreciate you being here. We have 109 people on at the moment. Um, so that is really, really, we could not have imagined that we'd have so many people. Um, our next event is planned for International Women in Engineering Day, the 23rd of June. Um, not confirmed yet, but that's what we're hoping for. So. Thank you so much and um, have a great day.